Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome, uh, and thank you for coming to the Barnard CS seminar uh, series. Uh, I am very delighted to welcome Jai Lu Jing from uh, Yale University, uh, who will also be starting as an assistant professor at Waterloo uh, next year. Um, Jai Lu's done a lot of really great work on the intersection of programming languages, verification, and machine learning. Uh, today, he'll be talking to us about uh, automatically detecting and preparing for Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mark, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, let's get uh, started. So, yeah, I like to start a talk uh, okay. with this, like, the quote, software, and procedural. They're pretty much the same. First, we build them, and then we start to print. So this is actually a, a, an old saying by a very famous software engineer, Sam Redwine, uh, 50 years ago. But it's just like a, uh, this old saying, it's getting better and better, where it just looks like it's not lasting, right? So Redwine getting better and better uh, as the time goes on. So actually, uh, if you ask why this is an important problem, so the cost of bugs are at roughly that big number for the US in 2020 uh, by a company. If you don't know, uh, how much money uh, it is, is actually 3% of the GDP of US, okay? So oh, it's actually a, a really large number and actually softwares are everywhere, software apps are everywhere. For example, like at IBM and Google, uh, they all suffer from uh, a huge money loss caused by the software errors. And uh, uh, Microsoft is another example. Sometimes they even figure out um, their engineers spend more time resolving kind of the software engineer, uh, soft, resolving this kind of the errors rather than developing the new features. This is a disaster, right, in terms of the engineering effort. So finally, if you ask, like, from where uh, we can get the most uh, large numbers of software errors, you need to take a look at CS education, right? So for example, here, uh, the largest competitive programming platform, the code force is actually record um, 15 millions of users in character programs. So it's a very large code base. And my research attacked these problems as its own and focusing on these three aspects. So for the real system, for the collaborative software development, and also for the CS education. Okay. Oh, during the talk, if you have any questions, just raise hand. Okay. And uh, I'd like to have these kind of questions. So let's dive into the first work. So uh, actually, misconfigurations are uh, more common than you think. Let me, uh, let's see. Okay, misconfiguration actually, all recording sound, it just has the mute icon. Oh, I don't know, it's okay, we're recording from a different one. Okay, okay. I see. Great, so yeah, from this picture, you can see that actually misconfiguration is super common. And if you take a, take a look at this, Pie chart here. So this is software bugs, right? This is the misconfiguration. It's actually two times uh, more frequent than the usual uh, software bug. So yeah, if you cannot see the screen, you can you can sit here. So um, I'll be walking around like this all the times. So it's actually misconfiguration are the uh, the bigger cost of system downtime right now. It's a very surprising result, right? Uh, but okay. So, Okay, so but hey, that was we had to talk about the software misconfiguration. Just give me one more uh, example for me to to better understand the problem. So what kind of problem are you solving? So I'm giving you this mode example here. So as a as a user, Apache user, your goal is to allow the access allow the Apache to access only one country, but also to exclude the the proxy visit within the country. Okay, it's, it's very clear. Uh, that's your that's your goal, and you might uh, draft. Uh, this uh, configuration to, uh, and send it to Apache, okay? So I'm gonna parse them line by line, but this is a real world example. Like, uh, for example, you you, you, you first uh, say some order and then you allow from the country, right? And then you uh, deny the access if they use the proxy, right? It seems uh, very um, simple, but clean and uh, an example of how a user use Apache, right? However, if you pass this to Apache and start a system, this is gonna you're gonna experience first. Um, the proxy was actually allowed to access the web server, okay? And uh, this is a 
a disaster because it's the exact opposite of what you intended to do. And the third thing is, uh, it's a nightmare for, for, for the user, for the engineer, because it's a severe security threat. However, the system keeps silent without releasing any error message to you. Okay, that's actually the, uh, the, the harm, the silence confusion can cause to your system. And as you see this, you, you need to uh, understand what is the definition of the silent misconfiguration here. So I define it in this way. So although user has uh, explicitly set this line, their configuration, right? Very clear. I want to deny the visit if they use the proxy. However, this line does not have any effect, which means that you can simply remove this and your system will behave exactly the same. So that's actually the silent misconfiguration here. So as a user, uh, you may find it very hard to address this issue, but as a researcher, uh, you know that it, it happens because of the reason, right? You, ha you, need, you need to find out this. So uh, because Apache, is, uh, the configuration will be finally parsed into Apache to the system to ask it. So we, uh, we can dive into the Apache source code to figure out what is uh, going on. Actually, if you look at Apache source code, you almost like immediately realize there was a problem here. So the problem is that if you set the order to deny and allow it to enter into the second branch instead of first one, and then any IP address matched with both will be finally overwritten uh, by this allow. You can see here, that's actually the problem. So it's the problem is not happen in the in one single configuration. The problem is that the interaction between these three configuration uh, settings and cause the problem. Okay. Uh, from this example, um, you can actually have uh, one insight, okay? Uh, it's very hard for, for a user, right, to just look at this configuration file and, and realize what's the problem here. But if you look at the source code, it's relatively easy for you to, to find out where the problem is. But the issue is that Apache has uh, millions of lines of code. It's very hard for uh, to ask any user to dive into the, such a detail, uh, such a deep detail uh, like us. So the intuition here is that we can extract a dependency of the configuration uh, near uh, source code analysis. And that's actually the key idea of the first work. So what we did is that we took two parties, right? The first one is the user's configuration. The second one is a party source code, okay? So we uh, analyze them jointly and this is our two config X. And instead of just like keep silent, right? For the system to keep silent without telling any error message, this is the error message we uh, output for you. And for the user, even though they don't know what exactly happened in the source code, after they saw the error message, they can uh, very easily know that the order needs to be flipped out, right? So that's actually the uh, motivation of our tool, right? To help the user to debug their configuration without um, asking them to hack in the source code. Okay, to make sure that this kind of like a, uh, a motivating example is not a one-off case. What we did is that uh, we did a manual survey of silence configurations since uh, it hasn't been explored before. So we manually analyzed uh, this silence configuration from these two platforms and figured out that the majority of them are actually caused by the interaction of the configuration with the values. And um, it is true that the majority of them um, happens, this kind of issue happened with no error message, which makes the users very difficult to fi uh, to fix. And none of the uh, observed error message is, is actually useful. And it actually makes sense because if you just see uh, this part of the code, and if you say that if I'm an Apache developer, probably this is the best code that I can wrote because it's a, uh, because you ask the you, you you configure it in this way and there's no reason to uh, give you any error message because it's not an error. Uh, it's the it's issue that you don't know the detail of the system to to such a level. So that's actually the key part. Okay, so to solve this, um, we design our config X. And in config X, we handle three different types of silent configuration. Uh, this advanced ordering errors we have seen in our modern examples and the the, the rest of two types. Uh, also involved with one configuration, either explicitly disable another one or overwrites another one. Okay, we will see more examples coming. Uh, but uh, one thing that is in common is that we want to um, 
from the source code uh, to get some dependency of the configurations. Okay, that's the takeaway. But but this is interesting how, how we can do that, right? So uh, the first idea is because you, you're not allowed to run the tool because otherwise that the, the damage will be there. So you should run the stack analysis, right? You can run it on the whole system. Um, the idea um, in theory works, but you need to analyze millions of lines of source code because they are Apache real, real world big systems and it's simply not scalable, right? So there isn't any stack analysis which can uh, do its job. The second thing is that you can do some uh, lightweight analysis is, as an alternative. What does this mean? That, for example, you figure out in the code, so one configuration A uh, explicitly enable another one in the code. And in this case, you can see that, okay, uh, if I turn off A, then the, the B will be turned off as well. So, okay, you can do this lightweight analysis to check um, if two configurations are controlled by each other, but the problem is that it cannot capture more complex configuration uh, relationship that I show you in the modeling example, right? These, these are too simple. So here comes our key idea, is that we think uh, we cannot make any uh, compromise in, in this part, stat analysis. We have to do this statically. We cannot run the tool, otherwise the, the, the security threat will be, will be caused directly. But the second thing is that we, we, we also don't want to compromise it either. So we, we don't want to uh, just focus on the simple dependency. We want to uh, derive a complex dependency, but how, how to kind of do this, right? And we actually analyzed the interaction of the code related to configurations. So if, you, if you're not super clear about what does that mean, uh, here is actually a simplified graph. For example, instead of analyzing the direct control dependency between A and B, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna analyze the code enabled by the setting of the config A, and then we're gonna analyze the code setting by enabled by the config B, and then if we can uh, derive the interaction between those two code chunks, then we can actually learn the dependence between A and B. So I'm gonna show you an example later, but that's actually the key part, the uh, motivation of this work, and the key methodologies. So uh, to fulfill this, the first part is that uh, doing the configuration mapping. So for example, here, this part actually takes uh, a, a specific part of the source code that consume the configuration, for example, order here, and taint it all the way down to the final place that the configuration uh, variable is consumed in that specific locations. So we do that for all the configuration related variables in the code. And the second part is that we uh, derive uh, the, the rule related to configuration uh, using our customized analysis. So this analysis is conducted on the fly of LVM. And the reason we do it on LVM is because we want to uh, make the tool uh, as generalizable as possible. So if the code, if any kind of system can be compiled to LVM, uh, it can be run with our tool, okay? So I'm gonna uh, use this example to show how we're gonna detect the misconfiguration in this config C error. So, uh, the user set C1 equal to B1, C2 equal to B2, C3 equal to B3 here. So what this color represented in this graph is that if you set, uh, this is the basic block of the LVM um, code in this specific uh, code chunk. And the C1 equal to B1 means that it coming out of the basic block one and go to this left branch, right? Enter into the basic block two, setting the uh, value of X to zero. And then C2 equal to V2 means that if you reach to the basic block three, it will enter the left side, okay? So finally, depending on the different conditions, uh, you will reach to the basic block number eight here and set the X value equal to one. Otherwise, you will go to this branch, okay? So by setting this, uh, this will be executed. And what we, from this example, we can see that if you set C1 equal to V1, and the basic block number two will be uh, traversed. And then if you set C2 equal to V2, uh, sorry, C2 equal to V2, and then the basic block number eight will be traversed later, which means that it overwrites uh, the previous settings, making your C1 equal to V1 uh, no longer uh, useful. So that's actually one of the uh, modern example, uh, as an illustrated mode example of how our tool works uh, by uh, analyze the code blocks controlled by this configuration and then uh, to deduce the uh, overwrite of this kind of relation between these two configuration settings, okay, with value. 
And then finally, uh, it seems too good for us to, to have this dual, right? So, uh, but um, this is not the case. Every two has the limitations. So a very big question is that, uh, what if there is some uh, false positive, right? Uh, generalized, uh, generated by our stack analysis. It's definitely possible because we only analyze the code if there is any connection between these two parts and we deduce any kind of uh, um, relations, but we never uh, thought about whether config A and B can be reached on the same code. Okay, that's actually a big problem. Um, and we uh, we are treating this as a feature and then we systematically develop uh, a new function that can reduce the false positive. And our uh, false positive or reduction is set, which means that we use SNT-based reachability analysis. How are we gonna do that? Suppose that you have learned uh, there's a connection between A and B here, and we will, starting from this basic block, uh, from from the from down to the up, and then compute that how, starting from the, uh, um, this location, reach to that config A, okay? So, uh, we can compute this kind of the uh, reachability condition for uh, the configuration A. This one is for the configuration B. And if we put them in SMT solver, we can actually see that it's not um, possible to reach these two configuration uh, at the same time. So from this, we systematically uh, remove the false positive we generated in our uh, previous like uh, rule uh, der derivation uh, process. So any questions? How do you extract these constraints from the program, the SMT constraints? Oh, so it, starting from this, and we will see that it, there are two ways uh, to con to to reach to this block, right? So either this way or this way, and then this is the L. Yeah. Okay. No, but, but the con conversion of a program into these set of conditions and branches that's automatic. You have. Oh, this automatic. Right? It's 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 from C to LVM. So there's uh, there's two for for to do this, and and this is the. Uh, uh, this is how LVM code looks like. Oh. Uh, it has already got the block and oh, very nice the okay. conditions. And well, that's each one is a basic block. Okay. Yeah, so basic block. each one is a basic block, exactly. Yeah, so, so thanks for the question. So using this method, we have detected the 30s for false positives, and it's a uh, guaranteed false positive. So I think we are uh, very excited about this uh, result. So uh, enter. Into some question. Yeah, uh, I guess this is maybe like a step back even further from the SMT based thing, but how do you know um, what code block corresponds to which configuration? Oh, like, do a, you need to manually label them or how do you infer these? That's a good question. So, because we have this configuration mapping and we already know that uh, this variable is con is configuration related, and then after parsing, after uh, translating to LVM, and uh, we will obtain uh, this register V1 that is related to this. But how do you know that very, like, do you have to manually annotate the source code in C? No, we, um, we do this automatically because uh, in all these three problems, they have a specific function. Uh, for example, here, it, uh, what we just need is that the name of the, of the configuration and it has a specific functions and we use automatic taint analysis to, to see that this variable is directly uh, passed by the user. So yeah, please. How do you know which function names match which? Um, That's a good question. Because from these three systems, we implement three uh, configuration mapping mechanism. And this is actually an example from Apache because Apache just used this order, the name. It has a specific function for uh, doing this. Yeah. But there, so there's a file that map all the configuration writing in this way. So for literally, for if a new program, for example, if I'm going to analyze my SQL, I need to re-implement the configuration method for my SQL. Yeah. I just have one more question. Is it ever possible to have intentional overrides? Like you have some local configuration and a global configuration. Oh. So the local has to override the global. Yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. Uh, but you, what you mean that is user intentionally over, override? Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, that's a very good question. Actually, it's possible. But if this is the case, uh, you can compare with our uh, error message. If you find that it matches with your expectation, it's good. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know what percentage of like the things you detected were intentional overrides, if any? Were, were any of them in that category? Yeah. Uh, from all the examples, you will see that later in the user study, we haven't 
uh, seeing that things happen in practice. Yeah. And it might be not a, a good, very good practice to intentionally overriding two configurations because if someone uh, see your configurations yeah. and then just like the dead code, right? Yeah. Your, your program, so you, 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 you will be uh, happy if you see that everything is written there for some reason. Yeah. But that's a thanks. That's a very uh, good question. So, yeah. So in our evaluation, we focus some two things. The first one is how good is your tool. Second one is how many. Uh, is this like a sign of misconfiguration, a real problem? Okay. So often it appears in the real world setting. So we have uh, apply our tool on three large systems: Apache, VS, FTP, and Postgre. They are. Uh, web server and file system and database. Okay, these are three uh, dominant system in this three large area. And uh, that's the result we have found and we confirm the correctness of our rule. And uh, it is noticeable that our tool is not limited to the three systems, uh, but we just pick these three systems uh, because they are very popular. And uh, since our tool uh, built on the top of LVM, it's fully extendable to other systems as well. And we, by applying the tool that we have detected, um, we found more than 2,200 silent misconfiguration across these three systems on these five benchmarks. And what's interesting is that one example that we found, we show, is actually the number one cause of HTTP 403 error by an Apache expert, okay? So from this, we can see that at least that our tool uh, can uh, lead to some interesting results. Okay, please. Uh, where did you get the configurations from that you were testing? Yes, that's a good question. So uh, from the Apache, because we focus on Apache first, we gather from three sources. The first one is the Stack Overflow. Is the paper, is the survey that we uh, described in the paper, but I uh, skipped it in this talk. So that's the data set that I made, uh, that we collected from Stack Overflow. The second one is from uh, the Tangings, the, uh, the, the benchmark we get. And the third one is from the GitHub the repository that we uh, mined this. And for the rest of this, because uh, we only get uh, this kind of resource, so we only focus on the, the data we got from the GitHub. But you will see that the reason why we uh, mine the data from GitHub is we want to um, report our uh, detected misconfiguration back to the user for their confirmation. So this is actually uh, one of the major contributions in this work is because we reported back to the original developer and to see that whether our tool can actually help them. And we are very happy to see that user actually confirm our detected issues and immediately use our report to fix them. For example, this is a very uh, popular um, GitHub repo. And uh, every time when you see this kind of like a, a feedback, you will know that you're uh, on, on the good track. So we are, we are very happy to see that we got the confirmation from the real world user. And uh, here's another bonus that from this work is uh, from one example, we can see that the user are not to be blamed because the Apache configuration is simply too complex. The developers are not to be blamed because simply user uh, hasn't dived into the enough details of our Apache. But sometimes the developers should take the blame here. So for example, in this example, um, user specified the idle session timeout to 600 in the VSFTD. And that's a real world example you can see from, from uh, our release, uh, from, from our paper. Um, However, if you look at the VSP source code, the issue is that if you set the idle session timeout to 600, and then uh, your idea is in entering to this else branch, right? However, uh, this VSFTD has another configuration called data connection timeout, and its default has been set to 300, which means that this kind of if, uh, else if branch branches will not even be executed if the user didn't change the default value for another configuration. So in this case, I think 100% VSFTD had to warn the user, if you want to specify this, you need to set another configuration, change its default value, okay? So that's the case I found. Um, our tool is, is helpful for user, uh, some kind of like a hard of the system configuration design, because that's the reason we can tell the user, if we have this configuration, well, we will, we will tell you that you need to set another configuration, okay? So in this case, User can be also uh, benefit from our tool. So uh, to sum up, in the first word, um, we introduce a new class of misconfiguration. Uh, we give a name called silent misconfiguration. 
and we uh, analyze the interaction between the code related to configuration to derive the specification and the report a specification to user to help them to uh, troubleshoot their own configuration. And we have detected more than 2,200 real-world cases, and we are happy to see that. Uh, our to de deliver the real world impact to users, and we are very happy to see that they uh, corrected their misconfiguration based on our uh, our report. Please. Um, so, at least in the example that you showed, it was basically like a fixed set of domains. Right? Yeah. Um, did you encounter any cases where it involved like regexes or sort of more complex style of things? And like, wouldn't this lead to a lot of like false positives? Because you know, maybe like there's two regexes, they'll hit the same code point, but they're actually mutually inclusive or something. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good question. Our tool is definitely not complete. So uh, motivated by our surveying the paper, we found out that that's three types of the misconfiguration are, are the uh, most popular one and the dominant one. So uh, we designed a tool to uh, realistically to uh, focus on these three types. And uh, uh, certainly like uh, regular expression, uh, all these tools are, are to be made, but it remains our future. I also have another uh, sort of maybe orthogonal question, which yeah. is, um, you know, I, I think it's surprising to me that you worked at the LLVM level. It's really cool that you can do this basically for like custom configuration languages. Um, but a lot of systems use, you know, JSON, YAML, like these existing tools. Um, have you thought about how you might uh, apply it to that where, you know, for example, JSON schemas are are already a thing, yeah. right? Um, have you thought about how to integrate with these kinds of systems that are kind of catching on? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So from the three systems that we analyzed, uh, there's actually the opposite of the question is that the configuration is just plain text, right? A is equal to B, B equal to C. So from this, you, you don't have any kind of like a, a grammar support. And that's the reason that we feel, feel these three systems are we mostly excited about. And for example, if the system uses JSON or YAML, mm -hmm. let's say like Travis or the continuous integration, these tools, uh, uh, we, we have other works focusing on this to to, to fix the, that specific types of configuration error, misconfiguration, yeah. And for, for this, you need to introduce more uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but this, oh, sorry, this work is, uh, hasn't considered that much, yeah. We only take key values configurations. Yes. Um, why would that be any different from this, apart from specifying the configuration mapping in a different way? So I know you like to map from configuration specifications to your variables that you're considering. Yeah. But as long as you specify that mapping according to whatever way you specify it, like JSON or YAML or even plain text, why should the analysis part be different? Well, it should be the same. It should be the same, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, you just need to specify a different kind of mapping I mean, from yes. JSON to this. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Oh, but you need to be careful about the JSON because um, I'm not from super familiar with JSON, but YAML, they have the sequence, the ordering plays a lot. Oh. Because for this work, we don't consider ordering because we map the uniformly from the configuration to this uh, to the source code. So we don't consider which configuration should, should appear before another one in the oh. fusion file. So that's actually another uh, caveat, or not the caveat, like the limitation of our tools. We cannot handle ordering errors. So actually, like Mars uh, published a paper with Rizitsa had to handle that kind of specific orders, like ordering errors in configurations. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So um, due to the time limit, we uh, dive into the third project, which is called, um, I, I like this one. It's called Incorrect Program Assignment to Automated Feedback. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with competitive programming? They raise their hand. Oh, great! So that's that, that, that's that's awesome. That's that. Um, but I still want to uh, like introduce a little bit more. So competitive programming is actually a big deal because more than fifty uh hundred students attend this event uh, every year, and uh, code courses is simply hold over one seventy four millions of user submissions. And all the large companies such as Google, Meta, uh, uh, Microsoft, Yandex, um, they even actually hold their own programming com uh, competition contest to, to pick the, the top talents, right, in this kind of events. So it's cool. And uh, I'm going to dive a little bit what is competitive programming because um, it's interesting because that's, if you look at the program description, so this is one of the real world problems from code courses. Uh, 1475A, uh, you have a goal is to determine whether the input end has any old divisor greater than one. Okay, very simple description, very clear. And 
Well, just in case that you're not super clear about descriptions, uh, there will be some example in pull up will also uh, given to you. For example, nine, uh, nine can be divided by three times three. So uh, you get this kind of example inputs outputs, and also you get some verbal or even graphic uh, illustrations. Um, but but you might, um, if you're not familiar with competitive programming, you might be considered thinking that why this is so competitive, right? It's just very simple questions, very simple input output. But what it makes competitive programming challenging is that this kind of resource requirements. For example, here, uh, you're not facing a very small number. You're facing an integer that can be as large as 10 to the power of 14. And also that your handle, you're going to ha your program is going to handle 100,000 cases at most, and your own time limit is two seconds. Basically, that is a very harsh uh, running environment, and your program needs to pass all this kind of criteria to make your program a correct submission. And that's the challenging part in the command of programming. And uh, uh, let me introduce a little bit uh, workflow to you. So in command of programming, uh, you will be given those kind of four things. And you as a user, your job is to come up with a program and submit it to uh, the, the uh, online judge, let's say. Okay, so the first test case is visible to you. It's an example uh, uh, test case. And all the rest of the test case are, you cannot see this, they are hidden. But you, your job is to pass all of them. Okay, so if you're uh, very strong and okay, so you, you came up with your uh, program and passed for the test case, everyone is super happy. However, if you fail on any of the test cases, what's going on is that uh, it's your job uh, to come up with a new program, a new submission, and then resubmit it to this again. Okay, and then if you fail again, it, it's your job to come up with a new program again and submit again. So, do you see the trend here? So basically that, if you're stuck into one program, uh, you might face the similar things that this user face. So fighting for the same problem, several hours, after trying 16 consecutive attempts, finally give up. Okay, it's definitely not a very good user experience. I think we all agreed on, right? And it's actually uh, exposing one fact is that uh, just telling the user the first to fail the test case might not be the best way uh, for them to learn. So this is a clear example. Uh, this kind of feedback is not good enough. So we, we are going to generate better feedback. And uh, focusing on here, this is a, a bizarre number. If you want to just remember one number here, that's a number I would like to, to remember. So 52% of the incorrect submission have never corrected by the same user. Okay, basically that's, that's how serious the problem is. If you consider like there's 174 millions of submission over there, uh, that number is uh, uh, came up with our uh, survey, but you can just roughly see that how many submissions have been unsolved in the code forces in general. Okay, so our goal is to change this for sure. So instead of uh, letting the user to fill it again and again, uh, we will, uh, generate this uh, repaired version of the code, and it's already uh, it will pass all the test cases and then return to the user uh, for them uh, to learn what's wrong in their code. Okay, that's the motivation. So, so wait a second, Jalo. So this is too familiar because if you're if you're interested in automated program repair. This is actually what they did like in the past 70 years. I'm not exaggerating or something, but this is literally the framework they adopted. So what's new here? So tell me what's new. So I'm gonna show you one example. Uh, this is a concrete example from the user. Uh, the same question, right? Code divisor, and that's the implementation. So the problem here is that that kind of the implementation is syntactically and semantically Correct. Okay, I'll repeat again. It's a syntactically and semantically correct implementation. However, it failed because this is the error message code force is telling you, the time limit exceeded error. So which means that simply means that this, the program is too slow. Okay, so this is actually a, a very um, bad thing for, for programmers because if you face this kind of error message, simply tell you nothing, right? And uh, What's really tricky here is that there's no bug in the code and the program is 
syntactic and semantic be correct. Uh, but the problem of this is that the algorithm itself needs to be uh, more efficient. You cannot write a program like in this way and pass the rigorous uh, testing. So how, how can how can we uh, test this, right? We need to interpret this question uh, in a different way. So how to say that? So think about the opposite of this. So what kind of the integer has only even divisor? If you think about it in this way that this kind of integer can only be represented to the two power of another integer only in this scenario. It has only all device, uh, only all divisors. Other than that, it will guarantee to have at least one old divisor. Okay, after you interrupt or uh, interact, like change the change the view of the problem in this way, uh, you can come up with this better submission. I call it a better submission here because it's uh, it can pass this uh, problem by using a little bit trick of the uh, Bitmap, okay? But, but this is super hard for the existing uh, automatic program repair tool to do this because they only focusing on the test case result, right? They don't touch on the uh, time limits. So how are we gonna do that? So what's the magic happen uh, behind this? Is why we can generate this kind of fix to user instead of just tell the user you're simply timeout. Yeah, actually, the, the rationale behind this tool is we analyze how the existing users handle their program, okay? So because we are shooting at one uh, competitive program problems, we have a very large chunk of enormous existing submission focused on the same problem. And we try to uh, distill a knowledge base from this and then use this as a hint to help users to fix their own code. So that's actually our overview. It's a little bit complex, but I'm gonna show you uh, these two graphs and help you to learn this. So suppose this is the user one. Um, after two failed attempts, uh, these are two successful attempts follow after that. So that's a second user. What we're gonna do here is that we're gonna learn how they change their program from the failed attempt to the correct ones and learn the program edits, right, during this and apply the similar edits to the new incoming program to fix this. I'm going to show you some concrete example. So the challenge is that different people write the program in a different way. And then it, it, it's, it's, it's not very clear how you can um, encode the program edits coming out of these two uh, versions of the program, right? So this is a research question. It's how you can define this. So in this work, we uh, define uh, a unit structure uh, that is able to uh, encode two different levels of code edits. So in the first one, we call a control flow level of edits. The second one, we call a statement level of edits. Okay, so we de develop our own data structure for uh, to solve this question. So let's take a look at this very simple uh, motivating examples. Suppose you have uh, two versions of the code. This one is incorrect and this one is a correct one. So in the first place, we focus on the control flow of the program. We uh, compile the program into this condensed ASG, and each node represents a control flow node. For example, this is a function, this is a for, this is an if, okay? So from this example, you can see that, okay, these two code, uh, the control flow structure are pretty much similar, uh, but, but there are some different difference here. For example, the control flow node four has been deleted, and the second step is that we're gonna uh, encoding this control flow edits. For example, here, what we learn from this uh, program transformation is that the, the node four has been deleted and then the node three has been replaced or updated with node five here. So that's the control flow edits change. And after we encoding this control flow change, uh, we focus more on the uh, Details. So for example, inside the same control flow node, for example, this is the same for node, what's gonna happen here in the, because there's no control flow uh, related, so it's basic block. So we're gonna do the traditional uh, giant chakra algorithm to, to solve uh, the same level edits, right? Um, between these two blocks, uh, between these two nodes. So for example, here, uh, we use these techniques to encoding these changes. And we also consider that, that different people have the use of different names. So all the variable names here are uh, replaced with some more uh, general variable name, okay? So here comes the repairing stage. 
So this kind of a merge sheet is what we learned from um, previous example, right? It contains information about how one user fix their own buggy program to the to the correct programs by right? after encoding the control flow and inside this uh, uh, statement I will edits. And then this is the NC incorrect program. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? We're gonna see if there's a four after a two, delete it. So there's no four here, so we're gonna skip it, okay? So if there's a no three, replace it with no five. So after we've seen this, this one, the, uh, no five is already there, so we skip. So we see the node three here after we seen this and replace it with node five and node five is already there. So we kind of just merge this, okay? So after this, this is the repair candidate we generate. So from the example, what's most interesting is that we can fix incredible programs with a control flow that we had never seen before. Okay, so that's actually the key part is how our tool can generalize on learning the mistakes from the existing user to new user, because you cannot guarantee that they have the exact control flow, right, that you wrote. But in this example, even though this kind of control flow uh, graph has never been seen in the existing database before, we are still able to generate the things like this. So that's actually the, the sweet part here. Yeah, so uh, reiterate this. And yeah, before I dive into the uh, evaluations, and I want to uh, say that this is actually the first work uh, on the competitive programming in our uh, PL and SC community. So be prepared for some uh, surprising uh, evaluation here because there's no existing uh, benchmark. So we focus on three things, right? It's very hard to define these questions. So the first one is how good is a tool? The second one is how good is your fix, right? The second one, the third one is that Compared to the existing tool, although there is, hasn't been a, a Apple to Apple uh, comparison, uh, how, how good is your tool? Right? This is something that um, we evaluate. We picked the six uh, code forcer problem that across three different levels. So from easy, medium, and hard, and they have different uh, various uh, tags. And the, the submission number from here, you can see that it's, uh, it's a um, quite large number. And what we did in the evaluation is, is very unique. So we divided uh, all our users into two groups. So in group one, we collect the user that gave uh, that they, they gave up on this question. They, they tried and they gave up. So the ground truth here is 0%, which means that because they give up, right? So the rational here is that if you can generate a fix for this, it will be certainly helpful because they uh, you're comparing this to 0%. And in the second case, it's it's more like traditional automatic program repair tech uh, side is that you try to generate the better fix then, okay, which is uh, closer to the original program. Okay, that's actually we divided how we divided the uh, user into two groups. So that's a result for the group one. And from this, you can see that on average, our two can generate the fix uh, at thirty five. Uh, sorry, 34.1% of the time. So although in, at the first glance, you see that this is not a very high number, remember that you're comparing this to 0% in, in, the, in the database. So it's still a uh, very encouraging number as the, as the first attempt. And uh, here's the result for the group number two. And you can clearly see that the, the repair rate has been bumped from 34% to 49.4%. Uh, so the, this is quite expected because we can see that if user can fix their buggy program, so it might be not that long, right? So they're not that far from the correct program. So that's actually the result of uh, group number two. And uh, uh, in terms of the uh, repair quality, because that's a key focus for the group two, and for four out of the six problems, we can generate closer repairs to user right, at the, at least 50% of the time, which means that we can generate high quality repair, please. I just want to clarify, um, when you yeah. say repair, you're basically uh, considering it's a broken submission to a correct submission. Yes. Right? Um, did you look at, because you have a number of test cases, yeah. if you look at like uh, this repair helped pass more tests versus? That's a good question. So we don't take a look at partial correctness. Mm -hmm. We only took a, uh, we, we only uh, treat the, the program that can pass all the test cases under the time and memory constraint as a correct submission. I see. Yeah. Okay. So in this work. So can you just explain again what closer repairs go? So uh, I will explain this. Syntactically closer. Sorry. Okay. Syntactically closer. Yeah. Okay. 
So which is a standard in Pokemon repair uh, immunity. Okay. So yeah, so that's a very good question. So how we can what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna uh, we're gonna see uh we're gonna define a new benchmark called this similarity. So because this kind of a broken program, uh, let's say the buggy program has never been cracked before. So it's so it's, we need to find a way to define how how easy or how difficult it is to to fix that program. Because if the program is it, it's simply like a completely is an empty program, so it's very hard for you to fix it for sure. Yeah. So to do so, we we take every buggy submissions and compare to uh, all the existing correct submission and pick the most similar one. And compute the token of distance as a number or uh, as the dissimilarity number. And from here, we can see that group one has uh, higher dissimilarity numbers, which means that their, their code are uh, generally farther, further than, than the group two uh, compared to any kind of existing uh, correct programs. Okay. So, which means that fixing group one is more challenging. And we try our best to do the comparison with the best of the tool uh, on the intro level programming assignments called Clara. And from this example, you can see that on the easy on the easy programs, so we didn't compare to the harder program because it's completely out of the scope of Clara. So on the easy programs, we have a moderate improvement on existing work, but on the medium problem, we only tried these two, and we have seen the uh, major uh, performance increase. So uh, that's the last slide. So in terms of the contribution, uh, this is the first paper at the PLSC topic conference on topic competitive programming. And uh, um, I hope that there, there'll be more papers uh, later on focus on the same topic. So I think it's, it's not um, interesting. Um, it's, it's not only interesting, but also very practical as well, yeah, to, to help people to understand the, the the broader definition of the program correctness, yeah, considering the resource. So uh, our tool automatically can repair incorrect competitive lab programs, and we have achieved a modest accuracy over uh, all the uh, problems. And in particular, we can fix 34% uh, of the submissions that has been uh, given up by users. Uh, this is a very challenging uh, evaluation, but we are happy to see that we can achieve that in the stage. And uh, the last thing is that this kind of work um, open a new uh, direction for the automatic program repair uh, because for now we need to focus more on the non-functional property side. So I'm going to show uh, because of the time and I'm going to show uh, one slide so to do so. Previously we focused on APR so all the APR took into the same uh, framework to take the incorrect programs pass the tool and generate the correct program, pass all the test cases. Okay, that's the APR. But now it's possible that you take the correct program here. For example, in this case, syntactically and semantically both correct, but you need to do that to generate a better program. So for your ideal output. So what does that mean? It means that if the program is simply too slow, your goal is to generate a faster program. If the program is using too much memory, your goal is to generate uh, a program that's using memory in a more efficient way and the energy as well. So these are actually the future of automatic program repair uh, as far as I can see. And uh, this slide tells you why this is APR for non-functional program uh, property is different from, very different from the uh, optimizer. So let's take an example here. So if you have a bubble sort, and you find it's simply too slow, pass them to any kind of optimizer that will not uh, bump into an analog and uh, time complexity. So you only get a uh, quicker implementation but not changing the algorithm itself. So this is the future that we think is very useful. Uh, in uh, This is the future that we foresee for the APR community that can basically fix the seemingly correct programs, uh, but with a better program. And I also want to mention why this is uh, a new thing in the APR community is because all the APR community realize, uh, like not, relies on the first stage error localization. But given a better program, like seemingly correct program, it's very hard for you to localize the error. Simply 
Because if you look at a program that's syntactically and semantically correct, it's very hard for you to look at a specific line tells that, okay, this is the place where error is. So we need to redefine the whole framework of the APR uh, in this kind of uh, non-functional problems stage. And uh, simply we can use a uh, large language model uh, on this stage, for example, to generate uh, over a fine tuned for its performance, security, code readability, better documentation, less energy consumption. And these are all uh, very open questions that I'm very excited to explore in the future. And finally, uh, I'm deeply grateful to my advisor, Rusisa, and uh, all my uh, collaborators. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the thanks for the next part here. And <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, so thank you, and uh, if we have any questions, we can take them. Uh, anyway. uh, I just wanted to understand the approach behind the competitive fixing, um, the little, little competitive programming fixing a little more. So um, you mentioned some sort of uh, AST reordering. So is that the only kind of fix that you apply? I, I think I might have missed a portion of that. Uh, is there some other kind of patch that you also apply to the program aside from this AST reordering? Or is that uh, the only kind? It's a little bit more than reordering. It's about uh, uh, learning the program edits. So for example, the edits is that, for example, you have four edits right. um, to fix the program. But if the new coming program only needs two of them, we can also generate, pick only two of them to fix exactly. that. Yes, it's okay. not a reordering, but um, updating. Yeah, AST updating. Yeah, so partial sure. AST updating. Yeah. And, and where do you get the... Um, things to plug in, like you're plugging in things into an AST. So where do you draw from? I think I just missed that oh, portion yeah, yeah. of the methodology. Yeah. yeah, the methodology is that we, we took the existing user submission right. and the, and extract two versions of it. This one is buggy, this one's correct, and right. we learn the program edits. I see. Yeah, and, then, and our assumption is that because we have a very large of the existing submission, mm -hmm. and it's possible that one of them, or combination of yeah. two of them, the program ads will work on your own oh, new program. Because all the programs are working on the same problem. Right. That's actually the the the, the, the rest I see. Yeah. And you have labels for which are correct and which are not? Yes, like, yes. So we have the, that. We have the label, we have the, the history. I think like you use that as part of your um editing process. Yes, oh, for sure. Yeah. We have the ground truths. Yes. So, um, right. So you, th this, I mean, it's, it's really interesting that this focuses on like uh, competitive programming because it's one of those domains where you actually have like this corpus of yes, this is exactly. right, this is wrong, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so there's two kind of orthodox questions. One is, um, are there other domains outside of competitive program where you see this kind of, uh, where, where this the exact same or similar techniques are applicable, where you actually have a large corpus of, you know, gradual repairs? Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is uh, more about the fact that um, do you foresee any like potential issues or unsoundness issues? Because it, it seems like this is largely dependent on the quality of your test cases. That's right. If you have a competitive programming problem with like some edge cases not covered, it's very likely that you produce a fix that just actually is unsound. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I'm going to ask another question like uh, one by one. So the first question is that, uh, let me repeat again. You're asking that, uh, is it possible to uh apply the this kind of framework into uh, other domain so one one domain that i'm seeing is very uh, applicable is about the uh, uh, industry uh job hunting process because if you if they are like asking legal questions it can be a very uh nice application so although they have they don't have such a strong time and memory consumption but our two can be directly applied to it as well mm -hmm. and the second question is uh sorry, sorry may I ask about the safety like oh safety right? okay yeah. that's a very good question because uh, that's one of our limitation mm -hmm. uh but all the existing work i have to admit uh use the test case and time and memory constraints as their uh we, we don't uh how to say synthetically generate a new test case and that and if you want to have the soundness guarantee you have to uh prove the equivalence of the generate of the program of the generator program to the uh teacher's reference program or to any of the correct programs something mm -hmm. like that but those kind of like uh, uh rigorous formally equations proving are out of the scope here and uh, there are actually one paper published pldi i guess last year focusing on that uh but they are i think on um, ocaml it's not on the the, the language uh, we are trying to apply, not on the scene, yeah, please. 
Um, thank you for the presentation. Do you focus just on the binary if it passed the constraints and the test cases, or do you also use information such as like how long it took and how many of the test cases passed? And how much memory? Because I guess you can imagine a case where the constraints potentially change. Like yeah. maybe now you need one and a half seconds instead of two seconds or one second after. So is that type of information also available and usable, or is it just like if it passed the given constraints or if it did? Oh, I think uh, for computer programming, the time constraints has been uh, capped for sure. But for for one program, uh, for for one questions, you you have like a two, for example, two seconds as the time limit. But you're not gonna like push it to one second or not. It's actually a set number for all the users. They have the they have the for one problem they have the, uh, the same uh, time limit. But uh, in your question, you you have a second idea. For example, we can use some. Or also, you have this question. So, like for example, if a program only failed on one test case and another program failed on all the test cases, they're certainly different. So, how we can actually leverage this kind of information for our tool development is actually. Uh, it's a very good idea, and we use that in our newest work uh, to be appeared at Oops 2024. We actually use the test execution, a uh, test case execution result to to pivot what kind of a program that you need to take a look uh, from this uh, from this from the database. Yeah. Um, I was I was asking more as in like let's say you have we presented with two competitive programming problems, each of which the actual substance of the problem is the same, but the constraints are different. Like let's say. One is 1.5 seconds and 250 megabytes of memory, and the other is, let's say, three seconds and 10 megabytes of memory. Are those entirely different problems in this domain because you're not using information about how much memory, and how much time each one took, or are those interrelated problems that you can use the submissions for? That's a very good question. We don't use cross problems information. So we only generate the fix in terms of one question. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I guess, so for example, if, if your goal is to, yeah, I think I think that's the answer. We don't we don't use the knowledge we learn from the problem A, let's say to apply it on problem B. No, we don't we don't use that. But it's certainly an interesting direction to explore. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like how I was just wondering like how for, for this kind of approach, how many problems uh do, maybe like you like plot out like a graph of like enough number of uh submissions or like number of uh, examples that you have already versus like success rate uh just like how does it scale with the number of uh submissions that you have seen so sorry, sorry i don't quite understand. so like you have a uh this knowledge base yep. for each problem yes yes uh i was just wondering how does the success rate of repair uh scale with like number of uh the, the size of your knowledge base oh, oh, oh i see i see i see what you're saying so you're saying that if we, uh, how we divide our training and testing sets, right? So let's say that we collected 90% of submission in the in the knowledge base and fix the rest of 10%, or we can put 50 50. But I think it was also like, uh, for example, the average uh, repair success rate was like 40 mm -hmm. percent Maybe you actually have already achieved the success rate after having seen like 10 submissions. That, that's, uh, that's a good question. So uh, there's um, uh, there's another work from uh, from uh, I think from Singapore uh, addressed this question. So how many uh, submission we need uh, to 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 come up with a, a fix? Yeah. But uh, we didn't do that in that direction because we thought like 80 20 percent of split is a standard for for, for our field, and we didn't explore if we split to let's say 99 percent to the rest of one percent. Uh, what's the result would be yeah but we just didn't do that in this way yeah but it's a it's a good direction um if you want to certainly uh let's let's say if you want to deploy the tool in the real world setting you will use all the existing submission uh, as it but it will be uh, at least better than the, the number that we are given yeah but we don't have that information we use the existing data so we just divided this 80 20 uh as usual in in our field Okay, so I want to cut off questions here. You can still ask questions after we have nowhere to be uh, for at least 30 minutes. So um, uh, let's just thank the speaker one more time and, and uh, no more questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah.